lets you delve into parts of this world that you might not see otherwise. So yes, it is like, you know, the back rooms of the casino kind of thing, but also just in general, like just the gritty underbelly of society, um, which is just a really fun part of a fantasy society to write about. Um, you know, we're not focusing straight on, on the, you know, the upper echelons and the politics and all of that. We're more just focused on the scrappy people that are, you know, fighting for, for everything that they have. All right, welcome everyone to episode 30 of SFF Addicts, where we'd be putting together a crew to pull off the perfect crime as we talk about heists and capers in science fiction and fantasy. And for me, heists and capers are just really freaking cool, blending together so many elements that make for engaging and fun stories, which is why I've assembled this crew of incredibly talented authors to discuss it with me. And first up is the scriber, the safe cracker. Robert Jackson Bennett. He's the award-winning author of the Divine Cities Trilogy, the Founders Trilogy, American Elsewhere, and more. So happy to have you here. How are you, Robert? Doing good. How are you? Good, buddy. Yeah, it's really nice to have you here again. And next we have the Enigma, the con woman, Leslie Penelope. She's the award-winning author of The Monsters We Defy, the Bliss War series, and more. And she also has a podcast called My Imaginary Friends, which is awesome. And I highly recommend everyone check that out. And it's great to have you on the podcast, Leslie. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. And also with us is the pickpocket, the thief, MJ Kuhn. She's the author of Among Thieves. Her debut novel and book two in the Thieves duology is Thick as Thieves, and that's coming out next summer. So congrats on that and welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, happy to have you here. And finally, the driver the brains behind the situation, Jonathan Nevere, <laughs> making his second appearance on SFF Addicts. He's the author of the Wind Tide trilogy, as well as the soon-to-be-released Stellar Instinct, which is out on December 1st. So congrats on that as well, my friend. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me back. It's like to be here. Yeah, me too, buddy. But to start off, I have a two-part question for all of you. Why are heists and capers just the fucking coolest? And what was a standout heist that you can remember whether it's from a TV show, a movie, or a book. So I'll toss it to you, MJ. First of all, I love that you just dropped an F-bomb because that sets the tone for me <laughs> in a really great way that will work well for me. <laughs> um, yeah. That's how we roll So heights yeah. are the coolest. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Heists are obviously the coolest. I think that part of the reason why I really enjoy reading and and then now writing heists um, is because like rogues and thieves, like they're just so fun. Like they're just so incredibly fun to write. And I feel like with a heist, it's not even just a rogue and a thief. It's like rogues and thieves that are smarter than me, mm. <laughs> which makes it really hard to write them. Um, but it makes it super fun uh, for a heist moment that I remember. So this was like the moment when I decided I wanted to try to write one. Um, and it was actually, so it's the gentleman, gentleman bastard series. Nice. Um, the second book, which I, I actually lies a lot more. The first book is my favorite one, but the second book, the reveal at the end, I don't want to spoil it for anyone that has not read it, but just the way I, in that moment, I felt like all the synapses in my brain connected, like every little, like breadcrumb that Lynch had dropped throughout the entire book. And I was like, this is the moment, right? <laughs> that book is so good too. It's uh red seas under red skies, I think. Yeah. So just be aware it is a heist novel, but it's also a pirate story. Yes, so. <laughs> it is piratey goodness and a heist and like a tall casino. Oh, it was so fun. <laughs> yeah. I love that book so much. Uh, Jonathan, what about you? Oh, I, you know, it's the cleverness for me. I think the cleverness that goes into the plan. Uh, I love listening to plans. So when we get to that chalkboard talk, I'm like so into that. I, I just love the, the details and the kind of the way that the banter goes on with the crew asking questions and, you know, getting weird answers and surprises dropped on them, right? That, uh, you know, recruitment has happened. They're not aware of. And I just love that clever 
cover planning stage is for me just where it's all at. And uh, it's because it's because you're a professor. Yeah, maybe. And I'm going. <laughs> I'm going really. I'm going to go really mainstream and say Ocean's Eleven for me. And that's because the other thing for me that I love about heists is characters. I love mm-hmm. the way you can play with characters in heists. And that crew was such an interesting group of people. And it's not even. It's not even the specific people it's it's their jobs right all those different Mm. jobs they have and then the way that the personalities get attached to them the way they interact i love that yeah oceans 11 is mine too i think i was like 10 when i saw it so i was just like whoa action they're robbing a casino and so happy about everything so the brazen right yeah exactly but going back and watching it later i'm like okay cool there's a lot of charisma but there's a lot of depth here too so i really (laughs) (laughs) and uh leslie what about you for me, what I love about heists is it's like competency porn. It's like seeing people who do a thing really well, <laughs> do it really well most of the time. And there's just something amazing about just witnessing that no matter what medium it is. Um, and so, yeah, creating that can be hard because they are they have to be smarter than you and you have mm-hmm. to figure out how you're going to get in their minds and do something really cool that you don't know how to do. Um, and an example for me, it was Six of Crows uh, by Lee Bardugo, which just blew my mind. And I was like, this is so amazing. Can I do anything, anything similar to that? Like I didn't, I never thought of writing a heist before and I still didn't think I could do it well, but it gave me the impetus to just try it out and see what I could make of the genre. You did a good job. Don't worry about it. <laughs> also competency, competency porn is like the tagline. Yes. For this episode. Mm-hmm. I love That's it. a really good line. I love Chef that. Kiss. <laughs> Beautiful. Robert, what was your sort of, uh, you know, attraction to, to heist and everything like that, but also a particular one that stood out to you? Yeah, I, I like heist. I, like, I feel like there's like um, types of stories that are great exploratory like vehicles where the reader starts off not knowing something and then the plot takes them into the world behind the world. And it's very like easy to feed them information. Um, the simplest one is like a farm boy who comes to like the magical city and like folks just walk up to him and like vomit exposition at him. And like, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) Uh, second one is like a, like, like a mystery series where the main character has to go out and learn stuff, but high stuff, um, is, uh, like you, you have to learn about how like the secret world works, even in like a fantasy world, like, like in oceans 11. You think you know how like a casino works, but these guys, they really know how it works. Like they know all the backroom stuff that you don't know. Um, and so that makes it really great for, uh, it's like a great way just to like deliver information uh, uh, to the reader and to like make up a cool world and feed it to them. Um, but I, like to me, there are really two types of heist stories. There's like the whimsical heist, which is like, like Ocean's Eleven. And then there's the doomed heist where you know in your heart this isn't going to work. Mm. Um, and for me, it was a Thief uh, by uh, Michael Mann, which is a really great um, doomed heist-like story about a diamond thief who, who tries to go straight. And I guess the second best like example of the doomed heist is uh, The Killing by, uh, I think, uh, Stanley Kubrick. That's another one that's really, really good. Not competency yeah. porn in either of those. They are not competent people. <laughs> But it still makes for a very enjoyable experience. And Robert, you brought up a lot of good points there in terms of, you know, why heists work so well in fictional stories. There's a lot of this stuff about like ways of feeding the character or feeding the reader information and stuff like that. But MJ, do you want to build on that and just kind of give your takes on why fictional stories are such good playgrounds for heists? Sure. Um, So, I mean, I do think that it is a good playground because it lets you delve into parts of the especially for fantasy it lets you kind of or i guess probably sci-fi too it lets you delve into parts of this world that you might not see otherwise so yes it is like you know the back rooms of the casino kind of thing but also just in general like just the gritty underbelly of society um which is just a really fun part of a fantasy society to write about um you know we're not focusing straight on on the you know the upper echelons and the politics and all of that we're more just focused on the p- scrappy people that are, you know, fighting for for everything that they have, um, which I think is a really fun thing to play with. I also do think that 
writing like crime. <laughs> so like violence and crime is more it's easier to explore those kinds of things in a fantasy or sci-fi world because the readers are so removed from the world it's easier to sympathize with a character who like chops someone's hand off you know what i mean um whereas we might not be so ready to forgive actions like that uh if the character is walking around you know chicago doing that but <laughs> you know rolling around in a fantasy fort um you know we can kind of take a step back and put ourselves in the shoes of a different part of the character rather than just applying the the like rules and morals of our own world to them mm -hmm. um, which i think gives us a little more wiggle room and a little more room to play uh with with crime in our novels <laughs> it's like mj just uh living out her fantasies in, in the stories that she's writing <laughs> i promise i'm a very peaceful person but my characters are not the same i, 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 would, I would just love to walk around with a handful of axes if i could <laughs> <laughs> I actually do own a pair of hatchets now. Oh, for sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was your gift for getting thick as thieves. The deal set, yeah. It, it was though. Oh <laughs> uh, hell yeah! And Leslie, what about you? You know, MJ already brought up that that uh, science fiction and fantasy, how that works into uh, why heists are good in this sort of fictional setting. But do you want to elaborate on all that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's also kind of the underdog factor. It's usually they're up against something impossible. It's always the impossible heist because if it was easy, you know, everybody could do it and you wouldn't write about it. So, yeah, we love these underdog stories about people just facing things that they don't think they can. And it goes back to the character and, you know, the ultimate character growth that you still want to see even in uh, a heist stories when you have like the group dynamics, you know, I like the found family aspects also where people are coming together. There's, you know, there's heists where they're already a team, Definitely. but most of the time you're, you're gathering the pieces that like you're gathering the players and then there's conflict and they have to figure out how to work together. And they come out on the other side, not just having won or lost, you know, their mission, but hopefully, you know, or sometimes, I guess sometimes having this, this extra family that they've created. And if it's a series, you get to go on and see them do other really cool things in the future. So I think those two aspects are, are things that I really love about heists. Yeah. I love that found family aspect too. And it's, it's so cool. Cause it's like, you know, everyone feeling each other out. Yeah. There's, there's so many cool dynamics there, oh, yeah. you know, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later in terms of like the, the relationships and character dynamics, but Jonathan, what's your take? So MJ actually said something that made me made me realize an aspect that I hadn't really thought of before, which is it, the relationship of morality and heists, which is for me really interesting because I, I didn't even realize it, but the heist that I wrote was a heist for justice. And so it was crime, but it was being done for justice. And, you mm -hmm. know, that's not uncommon, mm -hmm. but I never really thought of it that way. You're yeah. kind of like you're having to break the break the rules of the law to get something maybe to get a form of justice and whether that justice is legally bad, right. Or just some larger morality. There was an interesting thing there that I hadn't thought about. So I just wanted to say that, cause that was really, really cool. But for me, sci-fi, I mean, look, it's like, it's gadgets. I mean, that's just so cool when you're in the sci-fi world, it's like, you know, I, I get stuck in a plot moment with a heist and it's like, no, I'm not stuck. Like I'll invent this really cool gadget that the tech <laughs> hacker just created right on their, you know, FTL run and here it is, right? And it's this really cool thing. And, you know, gadgets are really fun in heists. And I'm thinking like in Ocean's Eleven, those two brothers, right? Who have all those like, you know, those two mm -hmm. brothers, right? You know, little remote control trucks and things. And, you know, there's so much you can do with sci-fi that I really like with that. Oh, I love that too. Yeah. I, just, I mean, 10 year old me was just in love with the fact that it's like, oh my God, like tech can like, you can rob people with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably the not cable, the best thing. Mission Impossible yeah. cable, you know, like dropping on the floor, right down to the floor, that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Tom Cruise got some good control there. Uh, Robert, do you want to, do you want to elaborate? You, you spoke about it a bit earlier, but on this point of like why sci-fi and fantasy are so ripe for, for heists and capers. Yeah. I mean, like, like the way that I think about some of these plot structures is like is that it's like cheat codes where it's ways to make the job a lot easier on yourself. And mm -hmm. for a high story, it automatically brings up a lot of questions that are like interesting. Like, why is this person like willing to try and break the rules so much? How has this role uh, pushed them uh, like to the margins so much? As well as like, you know, and I, like, I think what is fun about this is that we all feel like we're 
that we've been fenced out of some sort of like big success in the world somehow that there's someone in a big house somewhere who has it great that doesn't like deserve it and the only and it, this is it's quite cynical like uh, 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 uh this impulse but we feel or like if someone's just buying twitter or something like that <laughs> right that if someone was just <laughs> clever enough that they could uh that they could like deserve a piece of that money um but uh, the last question is, so what do you do next? Like, what do they do after they get the big score? What are they going to do after that? And how do they find peace? Those are a bunch of questions that, like, it sets up, like, automatically. But it's also quite fun to see, like, high stories where they don't set this up at all well. And it's terrible. And it's hilarious. And I was just thinking about this because uh, how did this get made? Just did, like, there, uh, just did a podcast on Dracula 2000 which I forgot I'd seen as a teenager and which this heist team spends, I would assume hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to plot out how to break into a safe, but they don't know what's in the safe. They're like, this safe looks serious. It's <laughs> gotta be something good. But it turns out what's inside the safe is fucking Dracula. And they wind up stealing Dracula. They're like this coffin's gotta be full of money. Let's take it back to our warehouse and get it open. But as it turns out, it is like an ancient evil inside. And that's like what, like what makes the movie so fun is that these people like have no plausible reason whatsoever to be spending all this time and resources putting this team together and they don't actually know what they're stealing. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's terrible. I don't recommend it, but it is great. <laughs> okay, I'd like my mind was just trying to piece everything together there. I'm like, okay, Dracula 2000, never heard of that. Sounds terrible just because they put the year in it. Yeah, it's not but, a great sign you put the year in it. <laughs> but it's like it's a heist movie with Dracula. Yeah, and of course it's Dracula in this area. Like, oh my god, they like oh. they're heisting Dracula and they don't know it, even though like it gives off massive like Dracula vibes once they see the coffin. It's like this safe looks really Transylvania. It's got yeah. skulls on it. <laughs> I mean, it's not <laughs> great. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Oh my god, that is amazing. Okay, I need to write. Sorry, I need to write this down. I got to see this movie. Um, and Robert, just kind of elaborating on that, you know, when you were kind of approaching the Founders trilogy, at what point did you decide like this needs to be a heist or incorporate heists? And I like what you said about the 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 finding peace afterwards because this is a trilogy, and towards the end, it's like much of it is about like figuring out how to save the world, but also how to kind of find peace in this this scenario that has gotten way bigger than they can handle yeah like i would say like first the the first way that i went at it was it was going to be a cyberpunk like fantasy with hacking and then i kind of had to figure out what the main character like who the main character was and at first my plan was to have her be a, like a character who just really likes stealing um and right away i was like this is not really working and i'm not sure why mm -hmm. and Eventually, I settled uh, like on the idea that she was someone whose like body had been hacked, that her body had been like had used a piece uh, uh, of this magic to hack herself like in some fashion. Um, and what she's trying to do as a thief is to get the money to fix herself. She just wants to be normal. She does not want to be like this at all. And it kind of brought up a lot. Uh, uh, a lot of interesting questions about how did she get this way? Why did the people in power make her this way? What does it say about uh, a city and a world like this in which they can use people like things? And what does peace look like for a person like this? Um, and it, like, is it even possible for her to actually fix herself? Um, that was, uh, um, it was a great way to build a platform to jump off towards a lot of cool stuff that i wanted to talk about I, I, so like again it's like a cheat code if you can get yourself in the right position you can do a lot of fun stuff yeah and also give yourself a really cool magic system that helps too that's that, <laughs> that's true cool and uh mj what about you when you're approaching uh, among thieves what was your sort of framework in terms of like this is what this story is going to be and i want it to be a heist or more so like I need it to be a heist in order to make this really click. Yeah, so Among Thieves came about in a very odd way. Um, so we we all know the the plotter versus pantser debate, uh, and I have always been a plotter. 
still am, but I attempted to, to just pants a novel, right? By the seat of my pants, just let's figure it out as we go. And it didn't work. I ended up with about 50,000 words of unusable nonsense. Um, but that unusable nonsense happened to be set in what would become to more the world of among thieves um mm. and so actually what came first was like the magic system um and the which the magic system in among thieves for for those who haven't read it yet is is quite twisted um there's you know only a certain number of people who have magic and they are all kidnapped as babies and brainwashed and then like used as uh guard dogs basically for the the elite which is horrible um so i had that piece and then i knew of course i'm gonna want my characters to want to give a gigantic middle finger to the person that's perpetrating that system <laughs> so what better way than to try to steal something from him uh something very important from him um so that was kind of how the heist came around um and then also i just i love writing like i said thieves and rogues and um so i already knew i wanted to be kind of like this gritty underbelly of this society uh the people that don't own these humans um and might want to stay get to the people who are responsible for that so yeah that's kind of how all of that came about for among thieves <laughs> nice i love that and leslie when you're approaching the monsters we defy you said that that six of crows was this kind of turning point where you realize like okay i could do this you know not sure how successful it's going to be but let's try it so what was your approach when you were starting that book so I had the idea that I kind of wanted to, to do a heist. And then I saw a tweet at one point that was something about Harlem Renaissance fantasy heist. And I was like, ooh. And I didn't know what the heist was going to be. I didn't know what they were going to steal. I didn't have any characters. That was literally all I had. And so I started from there. And I was, I was thinking about New York and Harlem. But I live in Maryland. And I didn't want to go to New York. It was the pandemic. I couldn't really go to New York. But I have you know lived in D.C., my family's from DC. And as I was doing research into the Harlem Renaissance era, I was just discovering all this amazing stuff that was happening in DC in the 20s that I didn't really realize was happening. And all of these Harlem Renaissance era figures who either were from DC or passed through DC. And I was mm -hmm. like, there's not enough books in DC. There's not enough fantasy books or you know any kind of urban fantasy, anything like that, that takes place in the city that you know is basically my city. So that was kind of the beginning. And then I knew I had some archetypes of characters, of Black characters from that era. I wanted a Pullman Porter. You know, I wanted to deal with African-American folk magic so that the, the magic system is based on that. And then I, I was kind of listening to music. I was looking for inspiration anywhere I could find it. And then I figured out, okay, I want them to steal this magical ring. I came up with this whole backstory of this ring that's originally from Africa that has these powers that's, you know, now it's threatening the community. And yeah, just kind of all came together really from the research and from that spark of not knowing anything to slowly figuring it out and then finding, you know, real historical figures that I wanted to put into the book from Langston Hughes and Carter Woodson to my main character, who's actually based on um, a real person that I found, like a little known person from history, not a famous person, but a person who had something extraordinary happen to her in real life. And then I kind of took her life off from there. And now, then she became the mastermind of this heist, like a very unlikely mastermind of a heist. Yeah, that's what that's what's great about the book is she's very much like, unwitting like and I'm just kind of fell. she's dragged kicking and screaming honestly <laughs> yeah she's like i just fell into this shit right. but she's the folk the folk magic is what really ties it together for me yeah. so that that was a really really cool element we'll we'll get into that a little bit later but jonathan for jatti's wager you know you already had this uh universe sort of established with goodbye to the sun and the wind tide trilogy when you're approaching book two you know because tonally Book one and book two are quite different, yeah. but you are doing something where it's like you're pulling from history in the sense of the Trojan War and putting it in this sandbox of, of yeah. far future sci-fi. So what was your kind of uh, thought process going into this? Yeah, so it was the second book, like you said, and I had a character who was a secondary character in the first book who was going to become one of the two MCs in the second book. So I already knew I had that character running. And I brought another character forward who was young. And so what I what I kind of did was um, I had this anxiety about second books because a lot of people were telling me to worry about the second book, you know, and not, not writing. <laughs> I, I wrote my second book like this. I got lucky. My third book was my hard book. But mm -hmm. but everyone was like, oh, the second book, you can't let it drag. Don't let it slog. Oh, the second book. And I thought to myself, what can I go to that's going to have a lot of pace and movement? And I always liked heists. And I was like, I'm going to make a heist out of 
book two. And I just kind of preemptively decided that. And so what I did was I sandwiched a coming of age story and a heist together. And so what that did was it kind of used the heist and everything that happens to Ilo, the character, through the process of the book as the way of the coming of age arc basically carrying itself through. And so the ups and downs happen as the heist plot happens. And so that that's how I got there. And yeah, I mean, I, I had used Greek sources for inspiration. So Antigone was book one with Goodbye to the Sun and the Eumenides was the third book. And it just happened to work out when I was thinking about things that I realized the Trojan horse, the myth of the Trojan horse is kind of a heist. The OG heist story, yeah. You know, it's kind of a heist. <laughs> And so uh, I, I basically riffed off that. And, you know, I, I actually played a little bit off of the tensions between the abduction of Helen and other things like that as well, and Hector and Achilles, and threw that all in there. But in the end, we I did use the Trojan horse sort of analogy, but in a very futuristic sci-fi way. Yeah, super cool. I love that. And uh, Leslie, you brought up earlier about the, you know, the putting the team together and that kind of thing. I want to get into some of the fundamentals. We could also call them tropes since they are so uh, concurrent in different high stories, but things that are very fundamental to heists and capers, you know, we have putting the team together, uh, the incentives and, and the kind of reasoning behind uh, these people, you know, stealing stuff and uh, the plan, the execution, the escape, but then on top of that, the complications and the things that kind of get in the way of making that heist a success or the impediments that slow them down and have to rethink their, their process. Leslie, do you want to, do you want to build off the, the, the team dynamic kind of thing, but at the same time, comment on some of these other fundamentals? Yeah. I mean, you know, looking at how I was going to build the team, once I figured out who were these people going to be, because in mind, they, they all have powers uh, or four of the five of them actually have powers. And that's part of the stakes, you know, in this world, the magic system is you contact a spirit, you make a deal with a spirit and you get a charm and a trick. So something that is good and also something that's not so good. There's always a cost to everything. And so, yeah, these characters are really only doing this so that they can get out of these deals that have made their lives somehow awful. You know, that the thing that they didn't expect to happen, or maybe sometimes it's hubris. They were like, oh, that's not going to be a big deal when they were given the idea of the trick. And then it turns out to be a big deal, or they were just so desperate that they were willing to chance it. And uh, that having these kind of reluctant people, because they don't think they're going to be able to do this either, but the stakes are always what's really important to me. I mean, stakes can be very different depending on the the characters that you're assembling with. If it's like career thieves, mm -hmm. then maybe they're doing it for a different reason, but in the reluctant thief trope where they're all just sort of, you know, they have these high stakes where they really are in bad situations. And this heist is the only way to get them out of that situation. That to me is always really interesting as well. And it goes back to sort of the found family because <clears throat> you you have that opportunity uh, to, to get closer together, the, the push and the pull both, I think, when you have those kind of stakes where it's, you know, it's not just greed, it's, it's not just um, doing it for yourself because those are often less interesting. I mean, there's ways to make that interesting, but to me, it's a little mm. bit less interesting than being forced into it and, and having that, that push and pull so that when things fall apart, the, the relationships fall apart, the heist falls apart, the, the, the hope for the future falls apart too. And you have that really tense time when you, you know, you really have no idea how they're going to pull themselves out of that. That's also the kind of the fun thing as a, as a reader in, mm -hmm. in movies to, and the hard thing when you're creating it, it's like, how am I going to dig them into this pit that they can't get out of and then get mm -hmm. them out of it? Right. <laughs> And it's cool because at the same time, like sometimes the complications are external to the group, but sometimes they're internal and just based on yes. clashing personalities or, you know, even romance sometimes right. become, mm -hmm. becomes a very interesting one. Uh, Robert, do you want to do you want to comment on the team dynamic or like putting the team together and, and figuring out those puzzle pieces? Yeah, like I do have to say, I don't know if y'all have seen the episode of uh, like Rick and Morty that makes fun of, like like of heist movies in general and heist stories, and about there's no, like a heist and a heist instead of a heist. It, yeah, I have to admit, as a guy who wrote a heist book, meta heist, it really hurt a whole lot to watch that movie because you yeah, that uh, that show because it became very apparent that the guy who wrote it uh, hates heist heist stories, and uh, also hasn't figured out pretty good. I was like, yeah, I had that in there. Yeah, I had that. Thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, like uh, like a big part of that was like like putting the team together, and um, like with well, 
with mine in like Foundry side, the tack that I took about uh, that I that I took was to try and think of it more in terms of classic like like fantasy tropes where you have your thief, you got your wizard, you got your fighter, you got your sorcerer, and they all have their roles to play. Um, and what was fun about it was that they all really didn't want to be in the room together. They like they all knew that they had to do this. They just didn't really want to do it with these people. And to have them hate each other was so much more fun than having them like like each other like right off the bat. I found that one of my favorite things to do, like I grew up in a household that did not fight. Um, and but my favorite thing to do in books is to put a whole lot of people in a room and have them just fight and like call each other names and be horrible assholes. I had to cut a lot of that. I had too much fun doing that. Um, but yeah, that was a lot of the fun of it was seeing these people try and figure out how to work with each other while also hating each other and trying to slowly like realize I'm going to have to figure out who this person is and how to work with them throughout the whole of the story. Mm -hmm. And the sweetest thing is like they come to love each other and that's beautiful, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they actually do. It gets really sappy. Uh, But uh, they actually start to realize that they, that they start to like each other and then they actually form like a, like a business together whose job functionally is on a low key level, like heisting. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun to write that and to see them actually like become friends and start to figure each other out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that too. And MJ, what's your take on, on, I'll I'll say the team slash found family, because I love that dynamic. Yeah. So I have always found it interesting that in heist stories in general, obviously there's some, some key exceptions to this rule, but like you could have a group of like some pretty like scrappy people and they all still hold the line and like they stick together. Um, And (laughs) so my, my team, I call it the most toxic found family um, that ever existed on the page. So they they don't do that. (laughs) Um, They betray the shit out of each other every every turn um which was super fun to write i I, like robert i love writing (laughs) fighting and infighting and bickering and bantering um it's just so fun i also had to cut so (laughs) much of that because i just would like go on for like pages and be like all right let's pick the highlights from this one because that's too much um but yeah i just found it really fun to play with taking a bunch of characters who they're all broken (laughs) in a different way and they each believe that if they can get their hands on the prize from this heist in some way it's going to fix their situation Mm -hmm. that what's broken in their life but the kicker is they can't all share it (laughs) there's only one thing that they're stealing um so yeah it turns into a bit of a knockdown drag out uh parts uh but like sneaky (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, it is found family. And I think that the some of the most fun I had with it as well was writing the parts where, gosh, these people start to care about each other. And then it's very frustrating because they know they're going to have to pull the rug out. Uh, and I hope that the readers feel that as well. Right. My goal in writing it was that I wanted the readers to every time they're reading from a perspective, want that character to win. But know that they can't if character b wins um so yeah i just i've had a lot of fun writing all the betrayal <laughs> and i imagine book two is going to have a lot of betrayal too it's like you you end you end the book it's just like betrayal is inevitable yeah I, it's a really bleak outlook it's great engine. um you know come to my optimism <laughs> ted talk no uh- <laughs> come to my ted talk on heists as therapy slash how i like to abuse my characters <laughs> great <laughs> And uh, Jonathan, what about you? What was your approach to kind of like bringing these different MCs yeah. together and, and and building that team? Yeah, so this was everyone, everyone circulated around an, a Nexus character, which was Jotty. And so this was about pulling off the impossible. And everyone bought in because they in some way owed something to Jotty. And so mm-hmm. Jotty, you know, almost didn't have to ask, you know, but did because it was their daughter who needed to really be the focus of the of the heist but everyone kind of couldn't say no 
but they didn't even want to say no. They just wanted to do this for this person. And so you had the same problem, like Robert said, like uh, the fighting, uh, you know, I use some really cliche moments because I love them. Like, you know, the first time this crew person lands, you know, uh, the pod lands and the kid dust kicks up outside the main ship and everyone's waiting and they they see who it is. And, you know, she, she's kicking the pod and yelling at the driver right already and like you know walking towards them and then sure enough as soon as she gets there another person punches her in the face punches them she punches them in the face like you know that cliche moment right of like well these two clearly have history like but that's what's so much fun is like playing off of that history you know and you can just bring it all forward and start from a base of there's backstory here and you might not even ever figure it all out but all you need to know is these two people don't like each other and there's a reason and maybe i'm going to tell you halfway um, you know, it's like a breadcrumb along along the journey. But I, I really, I, I really liked that approach of like, you know, I'm recruiting you, and you know, you're gonna, you're, they're gonna do this not for the money. They're gonna do this for mm -hmm. Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to comment. I love the form of like breadcrumb in the form of a fist to the face. It's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty strong breadcrumb. Yeah, it's like a piece of toast. <laughs> I have to say that, like you know, the the show the sh the show moments where you first introduce characters in heists are really fun. Like Nisi, yeah. my favorite, who's the muscle. You know, they kind of they they go get her from a cantina, and she's ha she's holding a, a man over a ledge uh, over a swamp with monsters below it, holding him by the ankle, and she's extremely strong. And she's holding him with one hand, yelling at the crowd at the bar who are, are arguing for her to to, to put him down. And uh, you know, just those kind of fun moments where you can just introduce these team members like that is just mm -hmm. that it's half of what makes a heist so fun. I think. Yeah, definitely. The intro is huge, and. And I mentioned earlier the incentives, but also kind of how that plays into the plan, the execution, the escape in these big moments. Jonathan, do you want to continue on that track? Yeah, I mean, in my case, the motivation was very much a, a kind of a justice-based sort of incentive, right? I mean, you had a, two vying political systems, and internally in one, uh, there is a kind of a, a, a separatist faction versus the majority and the majority is making a bad decision and Jotty doesn't think they're making the right decision and that's where he steps over a line that's where Jotty they step over a line and basically say like let's do this ourselves and we just got to do it in time so we don't really break any rules or or break the system and so the motivation is to prevent violence and death on both sides because Jotty is a kind of a person who sees the big picture always and doesn't really think in terms of sides, which is their downfall too. Um, but I, I like that, that idea of a motivation kind of justice hiding behind a motivation of a criminal intent. Um, and the MC Ilo, you know, she tags along for revenge. You know, she's not there to, to, for justice, she's there for revenge. Spoiler alert, by the end, she is there for justice because she realizes, mm -hmm. you know, she goes through that want need thing. So, so the motivations in heists, I think, are really interesting when you when you tweak them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And Robert, what about you? When it came to the founders trilogy, you already spoke about the incentives of Sancha in terms of wanting to fix herself, to fix herself. Uh, you know, when her body's kind of like hacked, essentially. But what were what were some of the the other incentives that came into play when you were working on that trilogy? Um. Like it, the it, it's hard to talk about all of uh, the incentives that all the characters have without going into too many spoilers. But I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway, uh, <laughs> because so like what what's fun about uh, like what I found fun about writing uh, like Foundry Side specific uh, sp specifically is so you have a thief who gets hired to steal something from the docks, and in doing so she burns down the docks. Um, and what, like the chief of police who's there to like, like take care of the docs, of course, now hates her because he's made him look terrible and she has stolen from him, but he's very smart. She's smart too. And he, and he gets close enough to catch her. Um, and like in the process of doing so, they both like realize that the person that she stole from is like, is, um, the like wizard that like is in the trifecta of the group um and he doesn't find that out until like later in the story but what happens is you have a room full of people like that the thief has like like uh like pissed off incredibly 
where it's the like it is two people that she stole from and two people that she has like like uh, humiliated but she too has been double crossed by the person that she that uh that hired her and in fact has like unleashed hell to find her uh because she does not take back the thing that she stole so what winds up happening is that she has to work with these two people to try and find out who hired her and why and what are they doing because they slowly start to realize that this person is likely starting to put together something incredibly, like, like, like incredibly, like, powerful that could have threatened the whole of the city and kill tons and tons and tons of people. Um, so that becomes a, like a whole lot of the fun is as they slow as they slowly start to realize exactly how much like damage she has done to them, while also being like, "Well, I still got to sit down and figure out how to do it tomorrow with you." What a joy this is. <laughs> We're gonna have so much fun together yeah i love that and then you also you know build on top of that for the books two and three kind of incorporating the mythology and history of this world which is really really cool to to see this sort of smaller scale development in the first book expand into yeah. books two and three i love that yeah i'd say that the books sort of start to become um like a meditation on technology and mm-hmm. kind of how it works and the side effects of having it and you know the like like the first book kind of is like a direct hit on technology like uh, like the there are four big houses that control like a whole lot of technology and pretty much like the world and it feels a lot like like facebook apple and google and uh, like amazon and you can kind of feel that hate coming but but in the second book it starts to build like on the idea that Technology is overall a good with huge downsides. It makes the world a bit like a lot of the like like reasons why we are not like like monsters anymore is because we're not starving and because like we are comfortable and that is because of technology. However, it puts enormous like powers in our hands. So how do we police ourselves to make sure that we don't do something horrible with it? Um, and it was really fun to have someone come into it who has done this many, 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 many times. Um, uh, all the heisting, all the revolutions, all this stuff. And just flat out say, this isn't going to work. This is a doomed heist uh, like story that you're living. And eventually, everything's going to fall apart. It was a lot of fun to just drop that character in. <laughs> Starting out with a room of people just uh, hating on each other and then making it as tragic as possible. But Yeah, yeah. pretty much. For anyone, who, for anyone who hasn't read the Founders trilogy, I highly recommend it. It's uh, fantastic and made me cry, you bastard. But <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was somewhere public. <laughs> no. In a library where everyone was cry, quiet and they heard my sobs. No, it was, in my, it was in my bedroom, so it's okay. It was private. But, I was um, getting my nails done. <laughs> getting my nails did and <laughs> started I was just crying, hysterically. <laughs> crying over Locklands. Oh man. <laughs> Leslie, you brought up earlier the 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 duality between like charms and tricks. And for me, this was this really cool thing of like uh dual incentives. It's like the incentive of of wanting a charm, but the incentive of not wanting trick at the same time was really, mm. really cool. So um for you how is that kind of like a a good impetus for for creating the the incentives and and desires for each of the characters yeah i think that a lot of magic systems have you know have a cost you know you kind of think about a lot and especially drawing from uh you know this tradition that i was drawing from like conjure hoodoo different kinds of african american folk magic where there is that idea that you're it's an exchange and that becomes the big incentive for for most of the characters. But um, like Jonathan was saying, there is a justice element to it as well in that they're doing this for themselves. And as they go along, they uncover, you know, the the thing that this ring, the thing that they're trying to steal is actually having this nefarious effect on their community. And so there are the dual incentives then, and it becomes a question of you know, can we do this for the community and not just ourselves? And it raises the stakes, but it also tears some people apart because, you know, I don't, not to get into spoilers, but like multiple people want this thing, you know, and, and to, to free them, you know, on the team. And so only like, kind of like MJ, like only one person can get it at the end. And 
I don't enjoy writing the conflict as much as some other people do. I'm kind of the opposite. <laughs> it's like my editor's like, yeah, you need more conflict. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to get some more scenes of them like bickering and bantering because I don't have enough. And it's just like, that's always I'm fighting against myself. Like I want everyone to like each other, but I know that for the book to be more interesting, they can't always do that. So I'm like pushing myself to make them hate each other a little bit more and to make them fight a little bit more. Um, but yeah, and, and the other thing that I thought was cool, because there's five people on my heist team, four of them have these powers, but the fifth person, uh, who is one of my favorite characters, and I think she's a reader favorite too, Zelda, her. does not have any powers. And her incentive for being there is loyalty and friendship. She is trying to help her friend do this thing. And and she's also like a chaos monster, you know, like she just wants to be involved whenever there's <laughs> cool stuff going down that maybe involves illegal things. She, you know, she's down for all of it. I mean, she also is like, well, like ride or die for her best friend Clara and exploring her motivation as well because Clara's like why are you here mm -hmm. <laughs> and she doesn't you know my Move main out. character get out of my apartment exactly <laughs> yeah my main character is drag kicking and screaming but her friend is just shows up all the time unasked you know unbidden uh and so those kinds of different motivations are, are also kind of fun to write just the, exploring the relationships and the strength of of them uh, and then raising the stakes in their in, for each person in their own way yeah oh zelda is fucking awesome she's just like i used to be in the circus and i just like sneaking around and like pickpocketing people and right? just being a little shit disturber i love chaos Mon she's a chaos monster and <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful and mj for you you know you you mentioned a little bit about like these people being broken these characters being broken and the heist kind of being a therapy for them to try and fix themselves however much they have to be screwing each other over being duplicitous and that kind of stuff and just kind of playing the field you know for you what was it like kind of creating unique incentives for each of them that was probably the most fun part of my planning process um was figuring out what was going to bring each member of our of our team on board um i mean ultimately what what brings most of them on board is that they all work for a very powerful man that told them to do this um so they they couldn't have really said no anyways, but but similarly, uh, you know, to to Jonathan's, they they don't want to say no, but dissimilarly, it's not because they're they're honorable, <laughs> it's because they're they're planning <laughs> on screwing over the big guy, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think probably the most uh fun I had with motivation was uh the one, the one straight laced character on my team. Uh, her name is Evelyn. Um. And she's just like going through it. Um, at the beginning, you know, she just lost everything. And now she sees this as her only avenue to, you know, get back into the graces of the upper echelon uh, of, of society where she's been. Um, and to stay away from spoilers, but yeah, this is the straight lace character in the heist. We know how it always goes, right? She gets corrupted. Yeah, yeah, it's one of my favorite tropes. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, but, you know, throughout, she starts to realize that maybe the quote unquote good guys that she's been working with and for this whole time, maybe they're not so good. Maybe they're actually upholding a system that is really shitty. Um, and maybe she should be working with the people that are trying to dismantle it a little bit. Um, so, yeah, that was a really fun kind of character incentive flip to write um, throughout book one <laughs> yeah very cool and then on top of that you know we have like the big trifecta for me is like building that plan putting it together executing on it and then trying to get the fuck out of there because shit's gonna go crazy no matter what mj would you know just kind of uh putting your characters on a very confined sandbox like an island how was it for you to kind of put these pieces together get them on that island and then try to get them the hell off oh my gosh Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> let's say when you were talking about like you have to like get them into like the deepest, darkest part and then figure out how to get them out of it. So relatable. It's like, okay, I can get them into trouble. That's super easy. Uh, <laughs> but oh, well, yeah. someone, there's a mastermind that's going to get them out of it. Oh, wait, that has to be me. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> what have i done um yeah i have to be the smart one here oh, right? what, what is happening um yeah so it was it was challenging it was i i put them on a really small uh sandbox uh, purposely because yeah figure it kind of raises the stakes a little bit but um also for me the main uh beats of the heist 
part, like when it happens, when it goes down, uh, were all character focused beats. Um, so mm. like the mechanics of what actually happened changed a ton throughout my editing process, but it was the character beats that remained the same. That was the beating heart of that part of the story that I knew I needed to focus on. And I felt like making a zoom in on a really small location where they have to pull all this off made it really easy to zoom in on the characters as well. Uh, and, and hopefully that comes across, but yeah, no, I plotted this thing in Microsoft Excel, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) It was was just, I was losing my mind trying to like keep track of everyone's because it wasn't really even just one heist, right? It was five because every member on the team has got their own little thing that they're planning on doing. Mm -hmm. They're like, boop, you know, flip everyone else's bird. Um, So yeah, trying to keep track of all those nitty gritty details um highly recommend i now plot everything in microsoft excel because no, i'm i'm a big fan of a and weird yeah. <laughs> i have yeah, not I'll done like that but do i that. applaud yeah. you go ahead robert yeah. i was gonna say that i had to do that i'm writing uh a murder mystery and i do do stuff in excel for the timeline wow. where i was like how many like so they they find the body on this day but then we find out that the guy was this other place 12 days ago which means how far is the travel from that other place? Yeah. And like, because you know that you're going to screw that up and someone's going to say like on Goodreads, oh, yeah. like I found out. Right. That <laughs> actually, yes. And yes. you're going to be like, it. son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. No. Readers so like it. I made yes. sure uh, that's, what's also fun about like writing in like fantasy is that you don't have to give like, specific, they don't know how many days are in a month. And like, you don't mm-hmm. know like exactly like, like, which like, you know, um, so it's like 13 days, 14 days before, 17 days after you, instead of saying Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or something like that, mm. that can get you in a huge amount of trouble with a bunch of the, um, so yes, I support Excel for trying to fix all those issues that are just going to bite you in the ass on Like You don't know the cycles of my moon. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you okay. on a t-shirt. You don't know the cycles of my moon. <laughs> that that sounds, means yeah, that so many good. things. <laughs> good Lordy. <laughs> That sounds like a menstruation t-shirt. Yeah, that's gonna, you can't, you can't, you can't like head to school to go like get your kid with that shirt. They're going to be like, not that no. one. All right. No. I don't have kids. Don't I can wear it. Bad. There yeah. you go. I got a two-year-old. He doesn't know. <laughs> um, Jonathan, what about you? When you were kind of putting together this like plan, execute, escape kind of uh, framework for Jati's wager. How well, I can tell you, you, I definitely did not use Excel. You didn't, you didn't spreadsheet it, man. <laughs> I am like, Get on Excel it. is like this for me. I, I'm just, I'm not an Excel type brain. I don't know. That's, that's mind blowing. But I totally get why, because the, the torture that you put yourself through, right? Like I walked with my dog for days talking to myself, right? Trying to get out of those holes. Um, yeah, it's rough. I, I actually, you know, I, I was telling my students because we were talking about heists a couple of weeks ago. I told them you should play games like chess and go if you want to write like mysteries and thrillers and heists, right? Because like that thinking a couple of steps ahead thing is so important. And when you have those multiple characters, MJ, like you were saying, right? Every one of them has their own scheme going on. And like you have to follow the threads through because if you on your main line, right, if you make a change, you have to think about how it resonates with all of their motivations and their intentions. It's just wild um so i don't know what the question is i don't really remember what your question was but i just wanted to say <laughs> that um but i will i mean i will say i do want to i do want to just bring up that um i'm I, I hope we can talk about the fake at some point oh hell yeah because i'm talk- there's like you think it's this heist but it's actually this other heist. yeah 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 yeah. the plan yeah. within the plan stuff um yeah. because that for me with plotting was so interesting and thinking about you know, so you have the plan within the plan, right? And then the question is, which characters know about the plan within the plan and which don't? Mm. And then you have to write the POVs of them knowing and not knowing, but then also the reader and, you know, where to, you have to make decisions. How much do you want your reader to know or when do you want to let them in on it? And I think that's a really fun, complicated, thorny thing with a heist. But when it's done well, it's it's a a, a twisty twist. Yeah, I love that. I'm just imagining you like I know you go for long walks with your dog and you take nice Instagram photos, but you just being like mumbling to yourself. Oh, the I'm forest. the whole time. You know, it's like <laughs> you're sitting there just talking. You look if someone saw you from a distance, they would right, be like that person's very <laughs> weird. So you're, he shouldn't you be in charge of an that. animal. You, have, you got a map. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I need sure. Excel, MJ. Right? I don't know. 
That's it, man. That's that's what everyone needs. They need spreadsheets. Wait, problem solved. Yes. <laughs> it is super helpful. Because, yeah, I was twisting. So I heard someone talk about plotting like 3D chess. And when you have like yeah. five characters with their own motivations and their own kind of character oh, arcs. Oh, wow. It, it, the spreadsheet was absolutely necessary for me. But, but I, I use a lot of spreadsheets in my plotting anyway. So highly recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, for you, Leslie, on top of that, you know, like beyond just characters and motivations and stuff like that, when you're plotting things like, you know, the planning stage, the execution mm -hmm. or the fake outs and stuff like that, we can bring that in since Jonathan brought that up. And then, you know, the hopeful escape, the hopeful, you know, getting out of this crazy mess, you know, what was it like for you on top of using spreadsheets? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of brainstorming and then sort of digging deep into like, what everyone wants. And then also the sacrifice. I think that's kind of an important piece too. Somebody's going to have to sacrifice something at a certain point and maybe multiple characters are going to have to make a sacrifice. And that is, you know, going back into what MJ was saying about it's, it's the character work, you know, that, that finale, <laughs> that even the, the plan within the plan is often about the character growth and, and what they're willing to do and just to prove and show that they've changed from the person they were at the beginning. And so, yeah, when I was trying to figure out, okay, how does everything go wrong? And then what, what are the secrets? What does the audience, the reader not know? And, and kind of thinking about, okay, I've done this and I'm hoping they forget about it because I don't mention it for like three or four chapters. And I'm hoping that they, that when it comes back, they're going to be like, oh yes, that was that. And kind of laying that groundwork. But like mechanically, it's it's kind of like, okay, brainstorming all the things that could possibly could happen and then brainstorming the worst things that could possibly happen and then choosing one of those to make happen, you know, and uh, yeah, getting out of the hole is, is always difficult. But if it's a way to show either like multiple character relationships and how those have grown over the course of the book and then the individual character arc, all of that stuff, it's, it's yeah, trying to weave it all together and into the place that you want it to be at the end. It's, it's definitely the hard part, but it's still fun because once you get it, once you have that idea and you're like, oh, wait, I think I can do this. Can I go back and then rewrite five chapters to make it <laughs> seem like I knew it was going to happen all along, of course. Uh, but you get that idea and it feels so great to make it a reality and to be like, oh, they're not going to see this coming, I hope. Well, a lot of people will, but a lot of people won't. So it's fine. <laughs> or or they figure it out just at the right moment too. That's yes. That's the perfect yeah. thing. And this is the beauty of revision. It's like, I think, Robert, you and I talked about this earlier this year when we chatted. It's like revision is kind of that thing where you can make yourself seem way smarter than you actually are. And it's just like, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is kind of a jumbled mess, but I can rework it to make it seem like I'm the biggest genius in, in, in literature <laughs> and I'm just yeah. like busting people's brains. <laughs> yeah, the, the way that I think about it is like uh, in Groundhog Day where it keeps going on the same date. To make sure that it like that it gets better and better each time. Like, what if you could just like keep redoing your date, your first date, until you come out looking like you know, oh my God. like a fucking genius? Um, yeah, like um, like I like uh, I, I try to like with the high stuff. I try to be very plotty, but I often found myself struggling because I found that if the plot wasn't in the right character beats, then it really just wasn't working. Uh, because mm. you can have the best uh, twistiest heist, but if the character beats aren't really hitting, then people aren't going to want to follow you through it. And well, one instance when I realized that things aren't working is there's a part where you got your straight laced uh, chief of police guy and you got the thief who is like the main character. And there's a part where they realize that they're going to have to pull this really big heist and do some dirty stuff. And in the first version, it was the chief of police saying, no, I absolutely won't do it. And it was the like main character uh, having to go out and convince him to do it. And he was going to have to make this like huge confession thing. And I, and like, I realized like, this is not really working and I don't know why. Um, and then I realized like, it doesn't make, it's not fun if the main character's like mind is made up. That doesn't really work. And so I realized how it really had to go down was that the main character, the thief didn't want to do this job. And it was way more interesting to have the chief of police come out and be like, listen, we're going to break a lot of rules and we're going to do a bunch of dirty shit. And here's <laughs> why. And have him convince her. And once I, like, I realized that her character started to really settle in because like on the first draft, her character was very much a chaos monster. She just loves stealing. 
And once I kind of got that in my head, that that beat had to hit different. I was like, she's not a chaos monster. She is someone who takes the fewest risks like possible to do her job. She's cold and calculating right. and careful, but she's also like determined. Um, like one of the great uh, character beats in a story is in a uh, like, like Orphan Black, where a killer has the main character like trapped in a room. And he's trying to kick down the door to get in. But instead of like, you know, her freaking out or whatever, she gets a fire extinguisher and she busts a hole in the wall and breaks out through the freaking wall. And that really helps you know who she is. <laughs> that she's someone who is willing to break walls to do what she wanted to do. And it became a lot, a lot, a lot more interesting to sort of bring those beats into that, into like the main character, uh, Sancha. To see her crawl through a lakey, lakey river of shit and beat a rat to death, <laughs> like with her bare hand, and still be cold, calm, and calculating. Yeah, but this gets into something that I that I think is really important. It's like heists do a lot for stories in terms of giving you the the framework for you as a storyteller to build on certain aspects. And I think character is the big one. You know, it gives you such a good opportunity for rich character building because you have the team or the people around them that you can kind of build off of. But Robert, like you were saying, you also have those moments that are very um, high stress or very, very tense and give those characters the kind of impulsive uh, opportunity to show the reader an action that says so much more than dialogue or exposition ever could. Uh, MJ, do you want to build on this in terms of what heists offer you as a storyteller for something like character for sure i'm trying to figure out how the heck i'm going to answer this question without spoiling like all of the biggest moments in like the middle of <laughs> yeah, Ro- robert already spoiled his book Who gets yeah i already show? blew it <laughs> <laughs> full spoiler chat yeah. it turns uh, out rosebud was a sled <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, you have to wait more than what is it like 60 years before you spoil that? I think it's longer than that. Yeah, (laughs) it might be longer. (laughs) Um, (laughs) but yeah, so I forget the question now characters, how I can explore them in a heist. Um, yeah, I do think it's the moments of high stress that really uh expose who the characters are because uh, a lot of my characters are, and it's probably true for a lot of you know heisty (laughs) characters roguelike characters they're really closed off emotionally they're a lot of them are really putting on a front um several of them aren't using their real names um you know it's hard to get to the gooey center of a lot of these characters um and by jamming them together in very close quarters first on a very small ship and then on a very small island (laughs) Uh, you know, it, it does force them to kind of um, interact with each other in ways that they maybe have not interacted with another human in a really long time, um, which gives you the opportunity to kind of start cracking uh, at the outer shell. Um, so like my main character, uh, her name is Raya. She's and she's an unlikable protagonist. Uh, and I say that because that's, you know, what what she's been called. But like, I, I love her. I love a good unlikable protagonist, man. <laughs> uh, I'm a sucker for it. But, uh, you know, she's at the beginning. She cuts a man's finger off in the first, like, six pages of this book. Um, you know, she's she's not exactly, you know, throwing out roses and, and kisses it on the cheek, right? She's she's not <laughs> she's not a gentle soul. Um, but, you know, as the story kind of progresses, we kind of see why and what she believes about herself that makes her behave that way and makes her believe that it's necessary for her to, you know, be looking out for number one to that extent. Uh, and maybe see her start to kind of round a corner, um, which I think without the extreme high stress situations that she's put in repeatedly throughout this heist, um, I don't know that she would have rounded that corner. Right. Um, so it kind of gives us an opportunity. Yeah, for sure. And Leslie, what about you when it comes to your characters? They don't come from as shady a background of, as MJ's. But <laughs> yeah, like I think for the most part, they're normal-ish people um, who've been caught up in a lot of different kinds of circumstances. And the result of that is 
you know, they went to this spirit to get this, this deal. Right. And, and then it, it backfired on them um, sometimes predictably, sometimes not, but also, I think that it's it's about these characters in this time period. You know, they're, they're black characters. They're in DC. I wanted to create an environment for them where they're not necessarily fighting against the system as such. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the power differentials are different. You know, I'm, I created well, I didn't create it, but it was an all black community that was basically self sufficient in DC at this time period that I wanted to explore and put them in. And, you know, the world of 1925 is fraught with a lot of, um, ex, you know, external factors, external enemies, I guess you could say, but that's not really what they're dealing with. It's all about the community. So it's not an island, but it is a very small, you know, framework that I'm dealing with, a very small neighborhood. It's all very focused. You know, it's about, you know, 10 square blocks maybe, and that's kind of their whole life and they can live and work and do everything in this place. And that's the place they're trying to save. So ultimately it's it's sort of about a community. And whereas I could have focused on a lot of different other factors where there's other kinds of evil in the world, but I really wanted to make it kind of claustrophobic and have that very small canvas. And in terms of dealing with themes like justice and what are you fighting against, what are the what's like the bigger picture that these characters are kind of striving for? They were all pushed here into this place, you know, from these external factors that are not exactly the antagonists that I'm fighting, but, you know, by saving the community, they're kind of de facto fighting against the external antagonists, if that makes any sense, you know, having this place where they can thrive and be themselves and kind of be safe from racism in 1925 is the story where, you know, another version of this could be about the clan or something like that, which is cool. It's just a different kind of story. And so, yeah, I was really interested in these characters being their best selves and they're still dealing with all of their trauma and their internal struggles and all of that stuff, but they're also building something, you know, like the, the ultimate goal of the heist is to preserve and to build this special place, which, you know, was only around for a very small period of time. Um, but I didn't know that much about, and I didn't think a lot of other people had knew that much about. And so I was kind of like shining a light on that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. And for me, you know, my perception of Washington DC, um, I'm Canadian. So it's kind of like, I just see it from an external, uh, viewpoint, but you know, Washington DC, like the things that come to mind immediately is like government Mm -hmm. and, and presidents and the white house and, and stuff like that. So to see Washington from Obviously, it's in a different time period, but to see it from this perspective of uh, a small insular community within the larger uh, the larger city limits of Washington was really interesting. And then to have kind of that community be a really central focus gave a lot of uh, motivation for the characters that I that I really enjoyed. It's also like when you live here, you don't think about government that much. You know, I think it's mm. like you, you think about everywhere it's else. It's too much. It's just like, I don't want It's like my background. Yeah. It's like we forget, you know, like native Washingtonians, like my mom grew up, you know, born and raised, my family born and raised in D.C. They're not thinking about Congress or anything. That's like a whole different <laughs> world. It might as well be in the other side of the country. So that's yeah. the other part that, you know, it's kind of when you live here, that's not your world. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And Jonathan, you know, setting yours in the far future and giving them, you know, you, you know, you have these like different worlds to play with and then create from whole cloth. How is that on top of the, the heist story, the perfect kind of uh, foundation for you to give these characters big introductions, but then yeah. give them growth over the course of the story? Yeah, I think it, it's it's convenient sometimes and easy because you can set up different scenarios and environments to push each of them when you need to, right? Because mm-hmm. you have that broad space and canvas to work in. Uh, I think what I did was I focused on uh, the question of like, where is your line? Like every one of these characters mm-hmm. was going to have a line. And the team leader, he knew some of, the, or they knew some of their lines, right? And they didn't know some of their lines and they hoped they weren't going to find out where that line was because they weren't sure how they were going to respond when they reached that line. And then some of them are going to cross it and be willing to, and then some of them are going to retreat. And I, I I thought of it about, I kind of thought about it that way with each of the team people. And, you know, it was going to be these confrontations at different points uh, along the plot line, personal professional making a choice, you know, individual collective. Why were they there? You know, why were they really there, right? When they started to realize, maybe I'm not here for the reason I think I'm here, right? And like, so now what, so what are you going to do about it? And those were those moments where I think the character arcs really 
were able to shine through the the heist plot at different points. Mm. And I think as for the coming of age component for Ilo, a lot of it was about learning and watching these moments in the other characters and learning from them and having a mentor who you can converse with talking to you about the cost of retribution and vengeance, right? The, the, the benefits and the virtue of sacrifice, right? Like seeing this play out around her, I think was really powerful. And so all those things are happening on all the different moments in that heist plan as things go well and then don't go well. Yeah. And all of you have brought up this, this thing of like, uh, you know, moments that these characters experience as a, as a moment of growth and, and there are different opportunities for you to do it with a, within, within a heist narrative. But for me, one of the big things is like the heist narrative gives you a certain kind of structure through which you can, sorry, readers manipulate the pacing and tension that they receive over the course of the story. Robert, I'll toss this to you in terms of pacing and story structure. What did you find was beneficial or perhaps even challenging about a heist narrative in terms of how you could deliver your content on the page? Um, I think that really the, the key to really having a good story that pulls readers in is the rate at which the unknown is known. Mm. If you think about a story as a series of items that are veiled then what makes it really fun to consume is like how big is this thing behind its veil and what is the rate at which you are lifting those veils like there's a lot of things and like they're not all going up at the same time some of them are going slow and some of them like are going fast but the reader is is wanting to know more about what is going on back there what is that back there i want to know what is hidden behind this thing And heist stories are really built because a lot of it is about trying to get inside of something, trying to get into someplace hidden. That in its own right is something that folks find highly like attractive. Like there's this guy on YouTube, uh, he's called the lock picking lawyer. He's got millions of subscribers, (laughs) this nerd, like you just see his hands and he takes these like high grade locks and he shows you how to lock pick them. Like that, 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 there's absolutely no like no point in my life where I will ever need to know how to pick these locks that can only be like you mostly say that like, now, you never know. Yeah, you say exactly. that now and then I'm gonna be chained <laughs> to something in a car and going into the water. No, um, but like um, that, like th- the point of lock picking is to try and see what's being locked up. Mm. Um, and I think heist movies uh, or heist stories are all about trying to get further and, and further like into a place of value that doesn't want you there. That's highly like alluring. And it makes it really easy to set up all the like unknowns and control the rate at which those all become known. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Can no, I, can I jump in on that? <laughs> go, 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 Jonathan. Just go. because I, I, that's I, I, so interesting because you're making me think also that when you talked about the lock picking, I think also there's like a micro, there's like a meta and then this like close lens too, where I, I also really like all sort of using all those little nuggets, right, to kind of keep the reader entertained as you're pushing the larger plot, right? So like, mm-hmm. I want to, I want you to, like, I, I want to hear about how the lock gets picked. Like, right, like how they well, hack it, you know? Like, like the challenge is in like video games where there's a lock picking like mechanic, like in Bioshock, mm-hmm. we had to put like the water pipes together. Right, is right. that yeah. on the first couple, those are fun. And then they become like, oh shit, right. I gotta do this. Super repetitive. Yeah. And like, yeah. How do you keep it from being a lock picking right. game like mechanic <laughs> and have right. it be fun? Like it's a little bit like uh, the uh, Quidditch problem, like where like you kind of know what this like it's going to go one way or the other. How are we going to make it interesting mm-hmm. this time? And um, how's Griffin? And like you have to one? like throw in all kinds of crazy crap. You, like you got to throw in a big magic dog or something like that that like makes them die or like. Um, so like it like the lock picking mm. thing for me because I was very stupid to pick like a hard science like like magic system. Don't necessarily recommend that. <laughs> like and trying to figure out how to make locks interesting each time was actually enormously like difficult. And I kept kept uh, kept getting notes 
which was like, can you make this a little bit more delightful, but also simple? <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I don't know how to do that. I got to pull a rabbit out of some orifice every single time. <laughs> I'm just a complicated guy with complicated uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah, it's but like, like, it's like you got to tap dance and chew bubble gum at the same time. <laughs> How am I going to scribe my way out of this one? Um, yep. MJ, for for you, in terms of like the pacing and the story structure kind of stuff, how do you feel that that heist give you that right recipe to, yeah, just uh, play with readers' heads and really control the situation? Because I think that's what it comes down to. Yeah, for sure. I had a lot of trouble figuring out how much I wanted to reveal when uh, during the editing process. Um, I went back and forth and uh, beefed it back out and then pulled it back. And I went back and forth with with a bunch of beta readers throughout like over the course of like five years <laughs> trying to get this uh, hopefully to the right level. Um and, you know, with the, you know, the false plot as well, I don't want to, you know, give away too much of what happens in the end, but there are characters that are still not on the same page about what is happening and what has happened by the end, uh, which mm. made it really hard to plot book two, because then I had to remember who knew what mm. and what does the reader know? And this is why I use Excel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> came back to Excel. <laughs> um. But yeah, when it comes to like pacing, so I can appreciate a luxuriously paced novel, but mm -hmm. when it comes to writing one and honestly, generally reading closer to breakneck as possible is like my jam. Um, so, you know, I have had readers that love the pacing in Among Thieves. I've had readers that are like, well, this is like too, you know what I mean? Like too, too quick, too compressed. Um, so if you like breakneck pacing, that's, you know more your your jam maybe <laughs> um but i do think that the heist lends itself really well to breakneck pacing For because sure. there is always something happening there it's so there's disasters at every stage especially when not only are we carrying out a heist but the characters are throwing each other you know red shells in mario kart like every couple <laughs> chapters um you know it just it made it a lot easier i think to keep it fast paced and hopefully interesting uh for the reader without giving away everything yeah my my friend patricia a. jackson uh calls it galloping pace and because mm. she's she's a horse rider so yeah. she, that's that that's patty. her jam but yeah shout out to patty and uh i think it i think it's like for me it doesn't necessarily bother me if there's a really fast pace in a book it's just the next book that i'm going to read is not going to be just as fast as that last one it's like you know just read the book, finish it, enjoy it, and then fucking move on and find something else <laughs> that is a little bit slower, more luxurious, the way you call it, MJ. <laughs> yes, luxurious. Just, yeah, I mean, you know, everyone mm. has their own tastes, and that's totally cool. Yeah. But yeah, it's my taste. <laughs> yeah, I'm down with it. And Leslie, what about you? What's your take on sort of pacing and structure in the, in the format of, of heist? I think that the tropes of the heist are are comforting, like many tropes are. You know, people come, they expect certain things, and it's fine to give them that. Like, you don't have to feel bad about you know, the cliches, because that's why people are reading the heist. Like, they want those exactly. touch points, and they feel very comforted when they get them. And so for me, it was just, uh, at one point, my editor was like, okay, you, you didn't hit this one, and you didn't hit this one. I'm like, oh, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> we have to... <laughs> <laughs> I was just getting so caught up in in the other stuff that I was doing that I was like, yeah, well, this is it's like a softer heist, you know, because it is very character driven. And I, I love plots, but I find that even though I, I do like a good plot, I'm always kind of getting lost in the character stuff that I have to like remind myself to come back and and hit the plot points. But um, so, you know, coming from a romance, like I have a romance background, I also write romance. These tropes, you know, you can't be afraid of them. It's just like readers love them, they eat them up and they're not going to get bored. You you are going to innovate them because it's going to be it, th through your eyes. You know, no mm -hmm. one else is going to write the same uh Point, plot points as you are hit the same points in the same way that you are. The other thing with fantasy is that you have the the option to have the magic just do a lot of the work, or you, you're injecting Technology. it in interesting ways yeah. that you know can innovate in and of themselves. So, like with the locks and sort of it reminded me of mystery boxes, like J.J. Abrams' idea of mystery boxes. Hopefully, by the end of the books, you actually 
you know, find out what's in them and it makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> or at least you lost, go back and we're, do that. we're looking at you lost. Right. Yes. In revision, <laughs> just make it make sense. You know, just you can put some breadcrumbs in there, but it's showing people like in mind, they have powers and each person does their thing and watching them do their thing is kind of part of the fun too. It's, it's part of the heist. It's part of what you're expecting. And so yes. maybe they can do it in slightly different ways or when it's on the page and you've seen, you know, I have one character, Aristotle, who can transform himself into other people. He's kind of like a shapeshifter, but you know, he glamors himself into other people and it can be anybody. And so, you know, you're never knowing who you're coming across on the page. Then you discover, oh, that was Aristotle. You know, like you didn't realize mm -hmm. that. So that's an opportunity for surprises and for a, another way to get into, you know, places you couldn't get into because of these powers. So part of it for me was, you know, figuring out what the, what everyone could do and then, you know, having that be the raw material that I could play with. And when I get into a situation that I don't know how to get out of, okay, what what's on the deck? What are the powers that I have available to mm -hmm. me? Who is where? Can I put him over here so he can do this and do his thing? And you're hitting the point that people expect in a really fun way. And then that gives, that's what like the fantasy is great for. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leslie, you brought up tropes. You're on the right track. What are some, what are some tropes that you were? Okay. So I love that you, that you say like a trope for, you know, an individual writer, no one's going to do it the same way. It's because you're playing off of this foundation that already exists, but you come from such a unique perspective. You are such a unique individual that you're going to bring something unique to the trope table. But what are some from your perspective that you were consciously thinking about in terms of, I want to challenge this, or I want to subvert this, or I want to ditch it completely because I just hate it. It's, you know, what I call like the worst offenders uh, <laughs> kind of list. I think like the mastermind idea was really cool. And I, my, my mastermind, Clara is sort of an anti mastermind, like, because she's, she's brought into it kicking and screaming. She doesn't really think that she can handle this. And at one point, one of the other characters is like, why are you here? What are you doing? You know, it's sort of like, what do you bring to this? Um, also because she doesn't want to use her charm. Like she has this power that she's committed to not using and that throws a little wrench in things also. But uh, so it kind of subverts it in that way, you know, having, each person do their thing. There's, I can't think of anything that I hate necessarily in terms of heist tropes that I was thinking, oh, I don't want to do that. Uh, I mean, there might be something, it's just not coming to me, but um, the, the the twist was was fun to do and, and actually having Clara step up to the plate and create the plan within the plan because it's, it's kind of all her. Mine is actually basically mostly one perspective. So it's mostly from her POV. You're not getting into the other people's heads. So that was kind of an additional challenge to, to keep everybody really vibrant while kind of anchoring it in one character. And we have sort of interstitials where we get other characters' backstories and things like that. Mm -hmm. So they come alive, but that allowed me to play around with what the reader knew when, because we only see, and what the other characters know, you know, uh, cause we're only seeing really from one person's perspective. So, yeah, I think that was kind of one of the things that I was what, was just playing with that mastermind idea and what does it really mean and how can it be different and what does it look like when they're reluctant and they don't believe in themselves. They don't think they're the smartest person in the room necessarily, but they do have these special skills that allow them to step up to the plate at the time when they need to. Yeah, I love that. And Jonathan, what about you? Some some tropes that you were consciously approaching or some that you avoided entirely? Mm, yeah, it's Good question. I think I played around with the, you know, the team members a little bit. So like the muscle, you know, that the, the muscle can be quite intelligent and can actually really be in the end, the one who does something that um, was supposed to be done by a different team member who was supposed to be the intelligent one. Right. So this idea that they each have single talents, I think is a trope that I wanted to subvert. So some of them are hybridized, right. And, and mixed together, um, which I think, is a good is a good way of kind of subverting that a little bit and then my my mastermind also um i think you know you expect at a certain point that they're going to stand up for what you think they're supposed to stand up for and i had a twist on that where i kind of kind of turned that down and and made them seem dis almost like they disappointed everyone around them um, and didn't do what, what you expected them to do at that moment that you expect them to do it in a, every single heist um, as the mastermind and team player. And, and when they did that, it, it wasn't until the next book even 
where I think it gets illuminated clearly to the main character what that person had done in in this second book. So it kind of leaves it open ended, which doesn't bring a lot of closure to the heist itself. Um, and it's kind of a failed heist anyways, but a success is but the success is different than the one they go out to achieve. Um, yeah, I also I just want to say, Leslie, I also wrote from a single POV and I also found it very challenging to to make all the moving parts happen um, and keep the reader informed. It was tough to do that. Yeah. Yeah, there's there, there's this thing about like access in terms of, you know, what does a single POV have access to or not have yeah. access to? It's mm -hmm. like, are you allowed in this room bec just because you're the POV? Maybe not. Because it doesn't really right. work for the context of the story that you enter that room or you are allowed into a certain space. Right. So I think that was really that was really cool. That's something that both of you played with. It's like sometimes you are left in the shadows because it's like, get out of here. You're not supposed to be here, but you're the POV. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. And um, Robert, what about you in terms of tropes that you actively wanted to challenge or subvert versus stuff that you just tossed to the wayside because you're a bit tired of it um i think it was like when um in like the one of the big big heists uh, in like the last and like the middle third of the book right before everything goes wrong um where there's like this giant mansion type of building that she's trying to break into hmm. and i don't quite know how to say this that's blowing it yet again but she functionally <laughs> finds out when she's broken into it that it is in fact a haunted house like a gigantic, gigantic haunted house. Um, because so, like, scribing is the art of, uh, like, imbuing objects with, of, like, intelligence, with logic and rules. For example, you can tell an arrow, uh, you can write rules upon it that says, if you're loosed from this bow, um, then you aren't flying across the earth, you're actually plummeting straight down, and have been for some time. So then it flies in a completely straight line, and it goes incredibly, like, incredibly fast, like a laser beam. And so Sanchi has the power actually to touch things that are scribed and to feel their logic and feel their uh, like intelligence. And when she breaks into this giant building and she crosses the threshold, she realizes like immediately that the whole building is scribed and is in fact sentient because it starts to talk to her. And uh, she has this whole moment of like, it's like, who's there? And she's like, who the hell just said that? And uh, that became a really fun thing to do, to have her trying to rob the building while the building is trying to, like, figure out who she is and where she is and what she's doing. Like, <laughs> how can you talk to me? Was a lot, a lot of fun to do. And, like, uh, I'm just not realizing that I had actually, like, planned that a long time ago about trying to, like, it was like a cyberpunk. It's like it's like a cyberpunk story where mm -hmm. someone is trying to rob, um, like, a building that has AI. Um, but it was a huge amount of fun to make it into like a haunted house type story. That's I love cool. that scene so yeah, much. Yeah, that's cool. It makes me think of like Hal from yeah. 2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> now, I'm just remembering that scene now, and it's like I enjoyed it so much because it's like, yeah, that was one of those ones where I was like, I really actually didn't expect to do this, but yeah. this is working, so I'm just going to keep going at it. This is again, this is me being pants or not plotter. <laughs> It's a panting moment. It works. Yeah. But I like it. It's like a human, like talking with a flea that's like crawling on their skin and be like, what are you doing here? How can you talk to me? Get the fuck out. <laughs> I don't want you here. And uh, just to kind of wind things down a little bit, I want to know, um, or MJ, did I, I didn't ask you about your trope. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, geez. Oh, man. <laughs> tell me, tell me some tropes that you were actively you know, subverting or challenging and, and stuff that you didn't want to even touch. Yeah. Well, I mean, I kind of already talked a little bit. So like the found family thing mm -hmm. uh, was subverted a little bit because they, you know, kind of care about each other, but also they're all really shitty to each other uh, <laughs> in, in like a soul deep way, not in like a, oh, you know, whatever, Therapy. bickering over the TV remote yeah. way. Um, but <laughs> But yeah, I think I also played with the the mastermind trope a little bit as well, because um, spoilers for like the first quarter of Among Thieves, our mastermind doesn't make it on the heist. Um, so they have to figure out how to slapdash a new plan together mm -hmm. within like a week. Uh, I think it's 10 days, actually. Um, 
without their brains, <laughs> like the brains of the operation is gone, um, which I thought was a really fun thing to play with too. So, yeah, I love that. It's kind of like, and shit, <laughs> how do we do this? <laughs> Every, yeah, we're like, going to oh, get on a boat. Not. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. And now to bring things to a close a little bit, MJ, I'll give this to you first. Uh, give me your hypothetical dream team for a heist. It could be anybody you want in history wow. or in fiction. Yeah. So you teased this earlier. And so like literally in moments throughout this entire call, I've been like jotting down. Oh, I should have been doing that. Good plan. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan, where's you your know. Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, I got my Excel. spreadsheet. Did you do it in Excel? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I should have. It would have been much more on brand Damn. for me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So I have chosen all of my heist teammates from like just fantasy and sci fi. Actually, it's all fantasy. Um, okay. So my assassin, I want Ezio from Ooh, Assassin's Creed. Nice. Uh, yeah. So that's where we're starting. We're starting strong. And then, so for my like muscle, I don't know if you guys have read Kings of the Wild. Yeah. I want Ganelon. Shout out to Nicholas <laughs> Eames. Yeah, he's a good buddy yeah. of mine. Oh, yeah. I say I love Kings of the Wild, Bloody Rose, both two of my favorite reads of the last year. Um, my Thief, I want Kinch Nishanik from The Black Tongue Thief. Nice. Super you guys have read that one. Um, and then my Mastermind, this may be controversial. I want Littlefinger from wow. Song of Fire. Ooh. Yeah, like he sucks, but he's smart and yeah. he's a puppet master. I think he could pull it off. I yeah. think he could pull it off. Oh, there, I think he would talk us over. There's but. definitely a fake out in there for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. He's gonna sc- he's gonna screw everybody over. Good yeah. picks. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this is a bad plan. I'm gonna get <laughs> murdered, but that's fine. <laughs> nope. It's all good. It's all good. What's your role? Are you the thief? Oh, that's a good question. I forgot to give myself a role. Um. Sure. <laughs> I'm another thief. I'm. I'm. Maybe I'm Kinch's apprentice. <laughs> I'm the. Th- I'm definitely gonna die. I, I'm the. I'm the therapist. I keep everyone into. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> who else has? Who else has a team assembled? I'm almost there, but not there yet. So it's, uh, it's close. I have a very small team. <laughs> all right, Leslie. Leslie, toss it. If I'm, so, all right. The first person who came to mind for mastermind is Kaz from uh, Six of Crows because I think he's the ultimate mastermind. Uh, ruthless has like has a lot of things figured out you know you can't i don't think you can go wrong you you might not make mm-hmm. it at the other end but he doesn't really care but it's gonna happen either way <laughs> and then the muscle i picked gamora from um guardians of the galaxy Ooh, I think that she's nice. just a great you know muscle um yeah. so yeah i would be the stenographer <laughs> i'm just like the recorder <laughs> of, of activities <laughs> the bard i love it yes exactly yeah. the bard. that's a much better way to put it I like Bard better than stenographer. Yeah. Yeah. No, like Give yourself that. a little bit more credit. <laughs> but yeah, Very that's nice. all I have right now. <laughs> no, that's good. Robert, do you have any? Uh okay, so I wanted this like the A team style. Uh nice. for the muscle. For the muscle, I picked the T-Rex from Jurassic Park. Uh <laughs> for the face, the guy who does all the talking, uh like Ed Asner, but I realize he's dead, so I went with uh the corpse of Ed Asner. Uh for the brains of the operation. Jimmy Carter, the guys building houses like crazy. He knows what to do. Nice. Uh, and for um, the person in the chair, I picked Lydia played Elvira. I read her biography recently. And the fact that she found out that she was attracted to women and found love with one late in life is just really inspiring. And uh, I think that we should all, we could all use a little bit of inspiration these days. Dude, that is a beautiful A team. What's, what, what's your role? What's your role, Robert? I'm the van. You're the fan. <laughs> <laughs> everyone liter- literally enters me to escape <laughs> yeah absolutely it's not comfortable but we get along with it yeah Pl- plus there's rabbits in all those orifices so you know <laughs> of course there's a lot of problems with this van is what i'm saying oh, a lot of and jiffy loop cannot help <laughs> that is really funny beautiful beautiful buddy jonathan what you got man Oh gosh, I don't know. You all, you all put me on the spot here. Um, mastermind, I had Morpheus from Matrix. Nice. Uh, thief and Infiltrator, I want Gollum. Mm. And uh, for Muscle, I, 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 I'm I torn between Mando or Boba Fett, but I want one of them. Mando, uh, Mando, fuck Boba. Probably. My, <laughs> yeah. my grifter is uh, Mal from uh, Firefly. Ooh. I think I want my, yeah, my, my face. And uh, for my control base person back at keeping everything organized i want mj with the excel sheet 
Ooh, <laughs> <dude>. <laughs> Bravo, Perfect, sir. Right? Bravo. I got you. Awesome team. <laughs> Jonathan, what, what's your role in all of this? Oh, me? I don't have a role. Ah, oh, jeez. I don't know. Pilot. <laughs> just, I'm the driver. I'm just the bi- I'm just I wait, the I wait the in the car, exactly. Right? <laughs> the guy in the car. <laughs> the guy in the car. Oh. Who's not where he's Dude. supposed to be when they're running away and getting out, right? Where are you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the mini. Coffee. I'm in the Cooper mini. <laughs> I'm in Robert. What do you want? <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> And on that note, let's get some recommendations for books. That was fucking brilliant. Thank you all so much. Um, Leslie, give me a recommendation for a book or a TV show, a movie, something that for you is a, an essential heist story. It'd be a TV show. Um, there's so many good ones, but the British one called Hustle, it's like the British mm. version of Leverage. Uh, it's a little bit different tone, but I think it's great. I think they're both really great, but I would I would pick Hustle slightly. I think it's called Hustler Hustler Hustlers, but I'm pretty sure it's Hustle. <laughs> Nice. Is it one season or how many? It's like how many... eight seasons. There's a lot of it. Okay. Yeah. Or it's in the UK, so they call it a series. Or right. And there's like five episodes okay. per series. So, you know, it's weird. They're like 27 minutes long or something. I don't know. <laughs> that sounds awesome. And MJ, what about you? Um, yeah, I got to go with uh, the Gentleman Bastard series. Um, birthed my love of heists. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely recommend The Lies of Locke Lamora. If you like that book, it's like you'll love the rest of them. And I hear he's he's back into, or you know, back into getting things ready to publish. So hopefully we see. Yeah, I was going to say it is as a warning one of the many series of fantasy. Yeah, he's like he's up there with like George R. R. Martin and Patrick Rothfuss. Yeah, and and Rothfuss, right? The ones that are perpetually uh, forever unfinished. But like fun fact, so a couple readers have picked up on this, but the fantasy world Tamor is a not so subtle nod to Kamor, the city from Liza Black Lamora, because. I love it so much. You're a little, <laughs> little fangirl. <laughs> and uh, Jonathan, what about you? Uh, I'm I'm going with one that some people might not think is a heist, but I do, and it is Rogue One. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, dude. that's a heist. Yeah, because yes. mm. yeah. I I mean that I love I love Rogue One, and I, I like the layers of the heist and the importance of what they have to get, and I like the ending. So I would and, and I'd be really Andor's like fantastic curious tomorrow. to see if we ever get to see like the first cut of that movie. Because they had to cut that movie into like a billion different pieces and put it back together. So much so that the actors, when they sat down at the premiere, they were like, I, I don't know what I'm going to see. Uh, wow. Because like, I like I that movie, that. but I still wonder like, what if? The original, mm-hmm. yeah. And I, I like yeah, the book actually that too. Because it it's so good. The one that got released, right? Yeah. I love that, was like, that was like Star Wars Vietnam War with a heist. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. And Andor is great too. Uh, if anyone's yeah, watching that right now, uh, Robert, what's your recommendation? I got to go with that episode of Rick and Morty that takes high stories and tears them <laughs> absolute pieces. The deconstruction. Uh, and like, <laughs> like it actually made me like them more, which was the funnier bit. Like the whole thing, it's like, you know, like it really leans into the whole, like, you think it's this heist, but it's this other heist. And you thought it was that heist, but now it's another heist. And it keeps yeah. getting larger and larger, more and more absurd. <laughs> uh, but, um, I uh, like until like the whole planet is a heist. Um, but like, uh, I actually found that I like them more now that I saw that again, like I find them comforting in fun, dumb ways though. It, it like, you know, it does make it a lot easier to clue in on like what's a trope and what's a cliche. Like trope is when it's done. Well, cliche is when it's not done. Well. And um, like, I've like, if it's like, if it's hidden on like on all cylinders, like the character beats are working. These are tropes that I like. Yeah. And if it makes you question yourself and the, the high stories that you're writing, even better. It's like, don't make me question myself, Rick and Morty. <laughs> Let me be happy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well, Jonathan and, and MJ, you, you both took mine. And I highly recommend both of those. I love them. I also wow. really love, I love Heat. Mm. That is a yeah, fantastic Heat. movie. It is so good. I watched that way too young, but I have three older brothers, so whatever. But I just that that's one of those movies that it's like I'll watch over and over again and just enjoy every time. Like if you like Heat, then you should see Thief, because that was one of his like first big movies. Yeah, you can feel Michael you Man. can tell it's like as soon as you like as soon as it starts playing, like this is a Michael Mann movie. Oh. Damn. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go watch Thief this weekend because I love Heat and you've sold me. And just the name, when you said the name at first, I thought you were talking about the video game. So, I, uh, but can, I also love the video game. I love game. that too. <laughs> the yeah, video game I series is fantastic. 
All right. Well, Robert, Leslie, MJ, and Jonathan, we did it. We pulled off our perfect crime and escaped with the goods and fucked over the bad guys. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. Um, If you could all let everyone know, viewers and listeners, where they can find you on social media. MJ, I'll toss it to you first. Yeah, um, you can find me across all socials, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, everything. Um, It's at MJ Kuhn Books. I'll squish together. Awesome. And Jonathan? Uh, Across social media, same thing, at J Nevere. Awesome. And Stellar Instinct is out on December. Stellar Instinct is out on December 1st, and it is currently on pre-order. Yeah. And Leslie? I'm on social at Leslie Penelope. And uh, the monsters we defy is out now. That was that came out in uh, September, August, August, right? Yeah, yeah, fantastic book. Thank Pick you. up everyone's books. I highly recommend. Those are my favorite heist, favorite high stories. Is what everyone here wrote. <laughs> and uh, Robert, what about you? Where can people find you? I'm on Twitter at Robert J Bennett. If you find me on a on like any other uh, platform, then you have found some who's fucking pretending to be me. Um, <laughs> On Twitter, I occasionally tweet about books, but I mostly tweet about uh, environmental permitting rules. And no, I am not joking. And your, your what, what's your uh, your tag right now? What's your name on Twitter? I know, I know oh, the shit. You always I change it. it. It was like it was Fuddruckers oh. for a while. I don't, it I don't know. Fud, it no, 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 <laughs> no. It was, it, uh, like it was Fuds Ruckers. Fuds um, Ruckers. Let's see okay. here. I mean, hold on. I got to figure it out what I changed it to. <laughs> It's Robert. Uh, it's Robert J. Bennett. But the the yeah, that's my that's yeah, my like actual handle. Name. But my name is actually the Honorable Candelabra Ardia Prefect of the Valley. Perfect. All right. So look for Robert J. Bennett and don't be turned away by that ridiculous <laughs> name. <laughs> but thank you all so much for taking the time today and chatting with me about heist. This was an absolute blast. So uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, Adrian.